Well, I didn't hope I, I hope I didn't mess it up. Uh, I don't have a producer today because Joshua is on his way to DC to meet up with a bunch of you guys and some other police light nerd news. Listen, big shout out to Josh Deadlight Media. He actually designed or helped design some of the lights that are going on like in the presidential motorcades and, and the FBI. And there was actually a clip on the news where he sent me a, a video and he's like, oh, I designed the lights on this car. Or like I came up with that technology, whatever it is. I'm not a nerd. I don't know the night stuff, but I don't have a producer today. So I'm on my own. Uh, big day for me too because as soon as I'm done with this show which I'm really excited about I have to pack up drive like an hour and a half away and meet up with Nick Pomachano Diesel Jack Media for another podcast with Save Our Allies after this but I'm in it to win it right now because I have Daniels who's not only a retired cop of some sort but he's also has a law degree and he is the editor and maybe the owner I don't know I'm going to learn a little bit more about it Police Law News on Instagram which I tune into and I have been tuning into for months uh, but I have him here to break down this very sad Trooper Justin Hare case. Also, I want you to be thinking about this. I To get ready for today's show, I googled violence on police statistics. Police shot in the line of duty. You have to go to like page three on Google to even start to see statistics. It's all who the police have shot. They do not want to talk to you about this extreme rise in violent crime, not only against citizens in the United States, but against police officers themselves. They don't want to talk about it. Why does the American public not get to know about the violence that is happening to police officers all across this country? Why is it that John Pear, Luke Picard, whatever her name is, doesn't want to say the police officer's name who was killed in New York? Why did Trump speak out against this before Biden did? What is this administration's obsession with their hate for not only U.S. Army soldiers that they don't want to name, but also police officers? We're going to dive into it today. Today's show brought to you by ghostpet.com forward slash Wolfpack Factor Meals.com forward slash Wolfpack 50 and the wellness company. Let's get it. Joshua, who's not here, so I have to do it myself. The growing calls across the nation to defund the police. To end policing as we know it. Off the charts violence in New York City. 11 people shot in just eight hours on Sunday. This is Sunday. about the police officers, officers who every single day put on that uniform and they run towards danger when we run away from it. Jonathan Diller, KIA in New York. Very, very sad. Of course, we have this case, very fresh case. Justin Hare killed the line of duty. A lot of guys from the FOP are starting to speak out on this violent rise in crime. We've had Gil, Gil Marty on, uh, the vice president of the FOP, to talk to us about this violent rise. He's been on Fox News a whole bunch. He's been on Blaze TV, I think, a bunch of other places to talk about it. One, uh, we have a live chat. And it's chatty. Kathy today, Loren, the folk, Slick Montana. Look, I got my mullet shaved, uh, or not shaved, but I uh, I got my mullet trimmed up. It's looking very mullety. He's got a mullet emoji in there. I love it. Murph 530, Rakiona, Puerto Rico says, morning, fam. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Puerto Rico. Uh, anyway, not going to go on it, but we are a live show. We do have live chats. You want to join in the live chats. I know that 99% of you guys listen on audio, but there is a YouTube channel. You can be a paid member and get your, your emojis and all these other things. Um, or you could join us on Patreon, which today's show is going directly to Patreon that I do with Nick Palmashano with Diesel Jack Media going over the new TV series that's coming out, Office Joe. I actually got it's all influencers, all the influencers you know, Jared Taylor, Matt Bess, I think, Tim Kennedy, um, uh, uh, Vincent Rocco, Vargas, Vargas Rocco, Vincent Rocco. Rocco Vargas, Vincent Vargas, Rocco uh, is in there. Uh, mandatory fun day. Uh, myself, I play the officer. What's good? 24 seven, the EMT, but everybody, like all these big social media influencers actually make a showcase. Jack Mandeville in this, this TV series. It's hilarious. I was so excited that I got to be um, the police officer in two episodes, but I'm going down there today um, to meet with the creator of this, but he's also with Tim Kennedy in this operation, save our allies flying to Ukraine, Afghanistan, uh, Haiti, and getting our allies out uh, when these collapse of governments happen. So a big podcast there follows on Patreon. It's less than $3. No, it's $3 a month, which is less than a cup of coffee a month less than one cup of coffee a month and it supports a great show 
uh, with a wide variety of hosts. Listen, we do five shows a week, all geared to inform and entertain first responders. We do society and culture news. Maybe you don't give a shit. That's okay that you don't care about P. Diddy and Hollywood and all the crazy stuff happening with the Oscars and the music. But you know what? Some cops do. And they would like to have other first responders' perspectives on these things and not just some kind of frou-frou, fruity, kind of like, you know, weird mainstream take on society and culture news. If you don't like it, don't tune in on Mondays. We also do true crime, mainly for the ladies. The ladies love true crime. Listen, our we went from like 13% female listenership and followership on our uh, audio podcast platform to like 23% because we do true crime. Listen, you don't like true crime. Don't tune in on Tuesdays. Wednesdays, we do political news. If you don't like political news, don't tune in on Wednesday. If you like the break test, but that's the crazy thing. But I get all these, I love getting these messages. I love getting message from you guys. Trust me. Like, Ego boost to the moon. Love it. Love jumping in there and seeing like 32 unread messages. And guess what? When I'm pooping, I try to hit all 32. Or when I'm driving down the highway. Just kidding, state troopers. I don't actually do that. But I love to see the messages. But a lot of them are like, man, I really like the Friday show, but I'm really not digging the Monday. Don't waste your time with the Monday show then. Don't do it for me. You're still part of the wolf pack. You're still part of the fam. You don't have to tune in on Mondays. Don't suffer through it. It's like, I don't like if you go to church and you don't do like 6 a.m. men's Bible study, it doesn't mean you hate the fucking church because you don't want to do the six o'clock in the morning uh, Bible study. But anyway, I love the things uh, and, and I love all your messages and I, I just love all you beautiful people. By the way, Anti Hero Podcast is uh, not with us today because he's uh, doing the Lord's work. If you haven't listened to the Marcus Luttrell video, I had half a SWAT team contact me about this uh they trained bjj i i trained bjj with a couple of swat guys and and they pulled me aside they're like bro i'm halfway through this anti-hero marcus luttrell thing like what the what the what like what do you what is your take personally eric and i dive into it and maybe what i'm gonna do with the anti-hero is do a patreon where i give because they went after tim kennedy um, on, a, on an episode or so, and you guys know that I, I'm uh, my agent for my book is Tim Kennedy's agent, and then also um, my co author is Tim Kennedy's. So I'm pretty tight knit with that group of Tim Kennedy. I also train with the coach that trained Tim Kennedy, was his corner man in the UFC. So, like, maybe we'll do like a little Patreon on the side gig on what my personal opinion is on these. And, and you know, it's like all the great podcasts. I don't have to agree with people, I don't always agree with the podcasters I listen to. Uh, but you know what? That's what's beautiful about it. It's not regurgitated. It's not coming from some kind of mainstream script. People are just saying things and we can agree and disagree. And that's why Patreons are. And that is why right now that social media is at the top of this weird social agenda to try to kind of manipulate it into a way where we all have to be like mainstream media. It's not like that yet, thank God, but it's getting there, right? We've seen it with the Instagrams. We've seen it. They're going after TikTok because they can't control it. That and X, they can't control it. They can't control podcasts, but they're going to try. Rest assured, I say in the next four years, podcasts are going to be heavily, heavily governed. That's just my Tamstradamus prediction. I don't want to get into that now. That's more for our political news Wednesdays. Today, we're talking about murdered in the line of duty, Officer Justin Hare. Before I bring this up, though, I do want to uh, mention the officer in New York, uh, Jonathan Diller. This, this this criminal that killed him, gunned him down, listen, like 20-something other prior charges. We see this all across the country. It's no shock to you, cops. You guys are like, whoa, thanks, Eric. Thanks for the thanks for the epiphany there, the wondrous thought. Thank you for the, you know, telling us something we didn't know, that, that our judicial system loves to kick criminals out on the street over and over and over again, and sometimes they murder people, and this time it's a cop, and so you care. No, that's not true. I care all the time. I really do. I think it's a shame. What I think is extremely sad too is that Jean Luc P. I, listen, I'll never say her name right. I don't know. I'm not trying to be disrespectful to the lady, but what what, what is her name? Does anybody know her name? I don't even have uh, my dead leg here to tell me what the name is. I'm going to unmute Daniel. Daniel, what is her name? Do you know her name? I don't know. Let me just bring you on now because you look pretty. Let me just bring you on. Um, nope. There we go. Uh, there we go, guys. Uh, do I call you Officer Daniel? Uh, what, what do you want me to call you, Mister Daniel? Daniel. Daniel. Daniel, Daniel from Police Law News, um, right here joining me. Uh, it's you guys know her. What, what's her name? Somebody in the chats tell me your names. But uh, 
you know, she doesn't want to say the officer's name. Why? Why? Well, like, what's the point, Daniel? Do you know why? If you were the speaker for the country, like if you were the one that was going to get up and address the nation on the president's behalf on a brutally murdered officer in New York City, Kareem John Pierre, that's her name. Thank you, Will Cry. Would you say his name once? Absolutely. You would think that that would be something important that, that you would want to say. I mean, we have the Kareem Jean-Pierre and President Biden. You have all these other politicians, and they're going to go to the funerals of people who are killed by police officers, most of the time in justified officer-involved shootings. But when it comes to a police officer, a hero who dies in the line of duty, they are, aren't going to highlight that at all because it hurts the narrative. That's what it's yeah. about. We saw when these office, when these uh, these soldiers were killed um, in this uh, Ukrainian or this uh, like Israel conflict. Anyway, the the seals, whatever this conflict is, I know it's not a, like a technical war that we're involved in. I you know, but you know the seals that died, right? And yeah. and, and and this Kareem gets on there and she was like the the uh, the the guys, the 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 men, the 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 fellow, the the guys uh, on behalf of the presidential. That why don't you say like the soldiers? Why don't you say the brave men who sacrificed their lives? Um, and, and it wasn't just the seals. I mean, it was the two, it was the two seals that died. And then it was the, the soldiers who died, uh, on the rocket attack, uh, was it in Syria? I believe it was, but, um, you know, it, she doesn't want to say the soldiers, the men, she, she, she beats around the bush. And I, I really, and, and I'm asking this in sincerity. I don't know why, what, like, why not just say the brave soldiers who sacrificed their life for this country? Why don't you just say officer Jonathan Diller, who died in the line of duty this week? It's very, very sad. Uh, is there some kind of agenda that I'm missing that we just don't say their names, but we'll say George Floyd's name for sure. Right? Like we'll say, Breonna Taylor and, and George Floyd and uh, Michael Brown. We'll say all these names a thousand times over, but we don't want to. We don't want to say their names. Is that is it? Is there something I'm missing? Is that is there a reason? No, there's nothing that you're missing. I mean, the reason it doesn't make any sense, but if they highlight that a police officer's job is is dangerous, then it might give some credence to the the, the fact that we actually need police officers here in uh, here in uh, every community across the country. Oh, yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, because we don't want that. You know, that would be like the worst thing for us. Uh, this Daniel Penny case is going on right now. Extremely, uh, you know, we need more guys like Daniel Penny. Uh, it's sad what's happening to him. He's getting uh, drugged through the dirt on this one. Um, I, I don't know. Listen, I, Daniel, let's have this conversation before we dive into Trooper Justin Heron. I don't want to take away from Justin Trooper Heron. This show is dedicated to him and his family uh, and to the guy, the brave men in New Mexico, the troopers out there, to the to the uh, EMT and EMS workers in South Carolina. Guys, this is about you. Uh, just a couple of things I want to touch on before we just go all in on you guys. So just stick around for a second or, or hit that fast forward button a, a few minutes um, and we'll jump into it. But I wanted to get into the Daniel Penny thing real quickly, though. Like, I don't know if I'm a cop. Now, I get that most cops don't know the news, right? Like, we kind of kind of shy away from it. I know when I was a cop, I didn't turn the news on at all, period. Didn't want to see it. Just wanted to be the furthest thing from it. So maybe, maybe the excuse here is that the cops don't know. But knowing what I do know, I don't know that I could put Daniel Penny in handcuffs. I don't know that I could do my job in that in that scenario and parade him around like they're doing it. I think I would have to call in sick. What's your thoughts on that? If you were told as a cop that you had to go and put this guy in handcuffs and kind of parade him around, we saw the officer kind of smiling about it and everything. I mean, is that something you could like? I, listen, I don't know if I don't think I could do it. I think I'd just be like, yeah, I'm not fucking. I, you guys do it. Yeah, so I, I think a lot of us feel that exact same way. And that's why for cases like this, like the Daniel Penny case, the politicians who run the police department, they aren't asking guys like me. They're not asking guys like you. They have people who work in the mayor's detail. They have people who work in special investigations where that's their job. And I'm not saying that these are bad guys or bad, bad cops, but like this is their job to do these types of things. So the mayor and the, the politicians who run the police department know that these are the people that we're going to have do this kind of stuff. They're not picking out just random cops from what whatever precinct in order to do these kinds of things and we all know it that's a that's a great point political police officers that are poisoning the profession that's been my favorite saying since i was a cop i made it up on my own so uh hashtag 
PPP, poison, uh, po political police poisoning the profession, <laughs> copyright or whatever it is. I'm kidding. Everybody can use it. Um, but that's what it is. There's more politicians or more police officers trying to, you know, I, I like to equate things a lot like church because the church is kind of ran similar to, to a police department in some aspects. But, you know, there's a lot, there, there, there's not a lot, but there, there is a loud minority of churchgoers that are there to climb the political ranks of the church. They're there because they want to be an usher. They want to be a director of music. They want to be the youth pastor. They want, and so they're politicking their way instead of just going to church to learn about religion or, or faith or have any kind of uh, feelings of redemption or repentance or, or whatever it is that takes you to church. What they're doing is they're sitting there and they're conniving. How can I, how can I get into this, position, this uh, elder's position or, or uh, this deacon position. The police department's the same way. We don't have a lot of cops that get in there and they're like, man, I really want to be a good street cop. I want to manage my beat really, really well. I want to be a good cop. I want to be the one who protects the serve. What we have is a bunch of cops that are like, well, how can I get my way into canine? How can I get my way into this slouchy community? That's why I'm so anti-community police. I'm not anti-community police. I'm anti-community police squads. I think anti I think community police squads should be like a two-month gig and it should rotate through officers who suck at dealing with the public. Oh, hey, Daniel, uh, did a body camera audit. You came across as kind of an asshole on that scene the other day. You're going to go do some community policing for two months and kind of learn to talk to the public like a human being again. And then we kick you out because the problem with these community police squads is that you get there, you get comfortable. You start hearing the public's gripes and complaints. A year later, you start blaming the cops and you start siding with the uh, with the, the, the citizens and you don't even get the police sides of the story. And then, and then all of a sudden you're, you're prim and proper and you're just trying to climb that ladder and move up in rank and your boots don't get dirty. You forget how to arrest somebody. They put you back on the line. You pull your gun instead of a taser and you fucking shoot somebody True story. We've all heard it. We've covered it on this show. That's my point with community policing uh, squads in general. But it's political police officers that are poisoning this profession, brother. Don't be that guy, right? Don't be that guy. Sorry, I just, you know what? I'm, I'm on fire today, Daniel. I'm upset. I'm upset that John pierre Luc Picard didn't say this slain officer's name. It's really annoying. I'm really glad that um, what, what that foundation is that, that decided to pay for their home. Um, you know, that makes me very happy. That, that brings me some good news. But uh, the violence and crime against police officers and the lack of respect from the commander in chief, it fuels and gives ammunition to the criminals in this country and it's hurting my feelings. It absolutely should. It absolutely should. And one, because I mean, I, so the Daniel Penny case, one last thing on that, that's something that I've, I've, I've covered a lot. And, you know, the, the people who want Daniel Penny prosecuted, the, the, the question that I always want to ask them is, listen, if you had a teenage daughter and she was going to be taken the subway in New York City, would you want her to be on to be on a subway full of Daniel Penny's or Jordan Neely's? And there is absolutely no one who would, who would want their teenage daughter to be on a subway full of maniacs like Jordan Neely. Right. Nobody would want that. Um, and, and, and the fact that 15 people stayed on the, the train to help Daniel Penny, you know, I, I like to say, find find me 15 conservatives on a New York subway in a row. So like, you got to take politics out of it. These people weren't conservatives or this wasn't a political move by those 15 people that stay on the train. Those 15 people that stay on the train, best case scenario, three of them were conservatives and the rest were Democrats. They stayed on that train because they knew that Daniel Penny was doing the right thing and that they needed to be there to help. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, uh, you got to take politics aside. You got to take politics out of it. The Daniel Penny case is is extremely frustrating. And um, and, and I hope it prevails. And listen, you know, that's why these elections are so important. I had Jonathan E. Mord from uh, the state. He's running for state senator in Virginia. I think that's one of the very uh, most important races going on for Virginians. This guy is running against a Soros-backed uh, politician here that's completely anti-police. You cannot, like I said on Wednesday show, I don't think there's a lot of absolutes. I, 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 you know, there's not a lot of absolutes in my life, but I will tell you, this is one absolute. You cannot be pro police and pro George Soros anything. That's an absolute. You can't be pro George Soros and pro first responders. Doesn't exist. Can't happen. 
not in this universe. Um, and so it's really important that somebody like Jonathan Emord, who is a constitutional litigator, uh, you know, gets elected because it's, it, these are these are crazy times. We're kind of on the cusp of of true anarchy in this country. And um, and this case that we're going to cover today with Trooper Justin Hare kind of shows you how brazen, how emboldened. And we're and this it's not just Justin Hare. You know, it's not just Jonathan Diller. It's police officers all around the country that are getting schwacked right now getting shot in the face, um, trying to help. Oh, a disabled car on the side of the road. <laughs> Let me see what I can do to help. Let me be the guy that society wants me to be. And then he gets shot in the face for it, which... You know, I'm going to let you break this case down, but I mean, that's kind of what it looks like and it kind of appears to me on its face. We're going to dive into it right now. Mark this, uh, mark, mark it at the 25, 23 minute mark. I'm going to do these ad reads so that we don't have any more interruptions. Say, show brought to you by Ghost Bed. Listen, the only reason you know why I'm so alive right now and I'm just so chirpy and, and passionate is like I like to say. It's not because I drank three cups of coffee before the show. It's because I got a good night's rest on my Ghost Bed. Mental health and mental wellness starts with a good night's sleep. And that's why we're always proud to be sponsored by and partnered with Ghostbed. They have funded this show's existence from day one, from the early days with Mike the Cop and myself. Um, they have kept everybody on staff paid on this show. And, uh, you know, it's one of the very few sponsors that just goes all in and says, we don't care, Eric. We're pro-police. We know you're pro-police. Do the Lord's work on there. Say what you got to say. Don't worry about us. We're, we got your back. We're there for you. They took us down to Florida. They gave us a tour uh, of the entire facility these guys are as passionate about beds made in the good old usa as i am passionate about protecting street cops and law enforcement officers and first responders all across the country they're huge veterans and when they did the 50 percent off thing when we decided to do the 50 percent off site wide with them they were like eric it's too it's too hard for us to give 50 percent off to just law enforcement and veterans how do we get their ids how do we know We'll spend so much time trying to, let's just do this. If they follow your show, if they use the promo code Wolfpack, we just know that they love and support first responders and we're going to give them 50% off. The cooling pillows, the cooling sheets. I don't go anywhere without my pillow. I have three ghost bed pillows, two in my, in my bedroom. And then I have one in a travel bag that I, I bought the bag separate. I bought the bag at like Walmart. It's a little plastic zippy bag. And I put my pillow in there. I won't go to a hotel or an Airbnb without my ghost bed pillow. It just doesn't happen. The cooling sheets, the adjustable base, all of the things that ghost bed has to offer right now, 0% down, 0% financing. And that's if you have NYPD credit. Cause you know, those guys aren't getting paid enough, but that's why you got 50% off on a ghost bed because they want all of the first responders getting a good night's sleep. They know how important it is. Uh, also we have factor meals.com forward slash Wolfpack five zero meal planning to the next level. You guys have got to get, you guys got to get tr more, tr better trained. You can never have enough shooting training, right? Like we always got to be under our iron sights. Always. Number one, you got to, you got to get into some BJJ. You got to get into some martial arts. You got to take one day a week to get you some skills. You got to court prep. You got to do it. You'll lose all your cases. If you don't You got to stay physically fit, you got to be a family man. You got to love your mom, your, your wife, your daughter, your sons. You got to do all those things. Where's the time go? That's why factor meals is so important. It's meal planning to the next level. All you do is go online, pick out your meals, hundreds of meals to choose from. You want to do calorie conscious and get lean and cut? Pick out some calorie conscious meals. You want to get jacked? Do the protein heavy meals. You want to do vegan or vegetarian? You want to do keto, carnivore? They, they have breakfast smoothies and shakes. Go on there. You click them. They're fresh, never frozen meals delivered right to your door. Every week, and all you got to do is put them in the refrigerator. You pop them in the microwave for two minutes. Even if you got one of those peasant uh, first responder firefighter uh, microwaves in the fire station, those shitty ones that never, you know, that normally take like five minutes. I'm, I'm telling you, two minutes and even one of those. These meals are ready to go. They look good. Stop eating like a peasant. Stop living like a peasant. You're a first responder. Gosh darn it. Act like one. Good night's sleep. Good diet. Let's go. Wellness fun, wellness company, last ad read, wellness company, promo code Wolfpack, 10% off. By the way, Factor Meals, factormeals.com forward slash Wolfpack50. Factormeals.com forward slash Wolfpack50. Wellness company, just Wolfpack. Ghost bed, just Wolfpack. Wellness company is going to give you all your ivermectins, your anti, uh, your monochloral antibodies, your Z packs, your malaria pills. If you're going on a trip, 
You want to get some pre-prescribed stuff for your trip in case you run into malaria or some kind of tick infestation or something like that. These guys are going to help you. This is backed by Dr. McCullough, Dr. Drew, all the guys that you've seen on the Joe Rogan podcast kind of fighting against big pharma on the next pandemic. So if you're a prepper, listen, uh, next week could be the week, right? We got that big solar thing coming over. Who knows? Last place you want to be is at Walgreens, CVS, or Eckerd's trying to fight all the meth heads and crackheads for drugs. These are going to get, they're going to be pre-prescribed straight to your house in a nice little kit, a survival kit, so that you and your family are already have your meds before the the next pandemic hits. All your ivermectins, all of it. So head over to the wellness company right now and uh, and and uh, use that promo code WOLFPACK. Get your 10% off. Get your good state peace of mind. All right. Um, somebody said Narcan. I don't know. I don't know if Narcan comes in one of those kits or not. Maybe. You could ask them. Uh, they're, they're very, listen, you, like you get a phone number and everything. Like you can talk to these people. It's, it's a great company. I'm going to play this. Uh, I'm going to play this clip from uh, the trooper, Justin Harris. It's just a news story clip. And then we're going to break it all down. Listen, I want you for sitting in your cop car. I want you to suck on this for a minute. I know that I, listen, you don't want to, I get it. I, I, I get it. I wouldn't want to, I don't want to hear this shit in my cop car. I don't want to hear this shit. You owe it to them. You owe it to the family. You owe it to the citizens who are voting on your behalf. You owe it to sit here and listen to this story. And no, it could be you. That sucks. I know. That's a harsh reality. Could be you. And you want people like us. You want people like the Wolf Pack fighting on your behalf. So suffer through it. Take it. It's three three minutes long. Um... But we we owe it. We owe it to the citizens. We owe it to the people uh, who are fighting on our behalf. Let me go ahead and share this screen real fast. We'll play it. And uh, you know in the chats, hit yes if you hear it right off the bat. No if you don't, just in case I need to adjust. A driver stranded on the side of I-40. And tonight for the very first time, we are seeing the frantic moments when law enforcement first arrived on scene, desperately looking for clues and desperately looking for the suspect they believe pulled the trigger. Griffin Rushton joins us now to walk us through this very intense video. Griffin? Yeah, Trevor, it was only a matter of minutes until New Mexico State Police and Quay County deputies arrived on scene trying to piece together what happened? Now, before we get into the video, let's quickly run through what happened that morning. State police say Officer Hare stopped uh, around here, around 5 a.m. to assist that vehicle with flat tires. It's about 10 miles outside of Tubencarry. This is where Jeremy Smith reportedly shot Hare, who was still inside his police vehicle before Smith reportedly pushed his body to the side and drove off in that police car. Now, state police say Smith pushed Hare's body out of the car a few miles down the road, that's along the frontage road here, before eventually crashing his police unit further down the road. Now, the video we are about to show you is from Quay County deputies. It includes the moments that they arrived at both of those scenes, all three of them. And I want to warn you, some of this video might be intense to watch. Uh, it was nearly 40 minutes after state police officers... I want you guys to watch this, and what we're going to talk about, we're going to break it all down. I want you to pay attention right here. What's the panic what do you think that these cops are feeling? What do you, the lump in your throat when you know that something catastrophic has happened? You don't know what it is, but the feeling in the air has got to be intense. And these guys, they have to continue to investigate. They have to continue to do their jobs, even though there's something very dark looming over them. Pay attention as we play this, as I play this. And I want you to think about how you would react in a situation like this, knowing that you got to continue to do your job. And one of your best friends, one of your squad mates is probably not alive. Probably not alive. You'd like to be optimistic, but cops aren't <laughs> powered by optimism. <laughs> so you know what they're thinking. I'm going to play it. Officer Justin Hare was shot on the side of I-40 when Quay County Deputy Mario Chavez arrives to this scene. Officer Hare's police unit crashed on the side of the road with lights still flashing. Deputies searched the vehicle, but the suspect is gone, and so is Officer Hare. I don't know if he might have gotten up. If he jumped out or something, he'd have to be able to back a little bit east. 
Meanwhile, Deputy Joseph Otera is running down the side of I-40. Approaching the white BMW, Officer Hare pulled over to help. Otero is holding his gun as he walks up to the empty car. Otero and state police officers are looking for clues and Officer Hare. That would have been behind him, so let's look over there. About 15 minutes later, I'm coming, I'm coming. Otero finds him on the side of the frontage road and calls for help. We need a 55 here now. 55 now. Within minutes, Officer Hare is taken away in an ambulance. Officers on scene reveal his gun was still in its holster. This is when the man hunt begins. I don't think there's anyone else, dude. They're all looking for this dude right now. Back at the crash vehicle, Chavez is trying to figure out where the suspect ran off to. The trail grows colder as the sun starts to rise. Chavez sets his sights to a van driving near the scene. Come on, passenger side. It's been nearly three hours since the initial traffic stop. There's no sign of a suspect. It's the same story for this abandoned truck on the side of I-40, now five hours after the traffic stop. Yeah, that manhunt lasted nearly 48 hours. Jeremy Smith was spotted at an Albuquerque gas station two days after that shooting. And I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to spoil the end for you guys. I'm not going to spoil the end for you. Daniel, why is this case important to you? Why did you want to come on here and break it down? So thank you so much for giving me the, the, the opportunity to, to, to come on and talk about this case. Uh, every time a police officer is injured or, or is, is murdered in, uh, in, in the line of duty, it's, it's in, important and, and tragic. But, you know, when things happen closer to home, it just hits closer to home. Um, and I recently retired from the Albuquerque Police Department um, about two, two months ago. So this, this happened, this incident happened um, just about two months after uh, I, I retired from a police department in this state. And, um, you know, that's why I've, I've taken, uh, uh, I've covered this case more than um, a lot of the other um, officers who are, are murdered in the line of duty. Yeah. Um, so in this case, you can hear every, the cops are out of breath, right? You hear that. They're walking up on this this BMW. We've talked about it on the show before, but the reason why they're they're out of breath is because there's a little bit of a panic there. And they're working through it. They're not conditioned black or anything like that. They're working through it, but you can hear it in their breath. They're not out of breath because they walked down the freeway on flat Albuquerque, New Mexico, or flat New Mexico uh, highways. They're out of breath because... There's a panic setting in, right? Absolutely. You've been there. You know what I mean? Where you go back and you watch your body cam, you're like, why am I so out of breath? Why am I so out of breath? Um, it's because your 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 body is working on a different level. So this this starts with a, an EMS worker being shot in South Carolina. And this guy's fleeing all the way across the country. What else do you know about this suspect? So at the time that uh, officer New Mexico State Trooper Justin Hare made contact with this suspect, he didn't know anything. It, it was later on uh, in the in investigation that police officers we were able to find out exactly who this guy was, and, and basically who he was, uh, who he is, is a guy named uh, Jeremy Smith, and he was from South Carolina. There was a uh, paramedic in South Carolina that was found uh, dead on March 14th. Um, and the incident in New Mexico happened on March 15th. Um, so it, essentially she was found dead and the vehicle that uh, Trooper Justin Hare was making contact with was uh, her white BMW. Um, it was a BMW that was registered to her um, unbeknownst to uh, New Mexico State Trooper Justin Hare, um, you know, he, at, 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 at the time, you know, he didn't know who he was dealing with. Um, he thought that this was a just a routine call. And I can get into that um, exactly, you know, why he was making contact with him in the first place. Yeah, let's uh, let's go into that um, real quick. What is your take now? Was she performing paramedic duties when she was murdered? She just happened to be murdered and be a paramedic. So it seems like she just happened to be murdered um, and she was a medic in South Carolina. Um, and right now, we don't know what the connection is, um, only that he is a suspect in that case. And he was driving her vehicle. Um, again, it made it all the way to um, Tucumcari, New Mexico. 
now you being that you're from the area ish, what is the normal response time for check-in units on a state trooper getting out on a, you know, I know what do you guys call it in New Mexico here? We call it kind of like a voluntary encounter or like a, like a request for service type type call. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, I mean, so I, like I said, I just retired from the Albuquerque police department, which is the biggest uh, city in the state. You know, Albuquerque has half a million people. We have over a thousand cops. Um, this, uh, this incident happened in Tucumcari, New Mexico, just about three hours away. Um, okay. So this was definitely in a smaller town. Um, so what the response time was there, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what it would be. Um, they have state police, um, city and county, but again, it's a more sparsely populated area. Um, probably like in the, where, where we're used to work, um, you know, if I needed backup, I had the luxury to know that if something happened, I had backup. I had 10 cops there within a minute. And I always had that luxury. And there's a lot of places in, in my state where that isn't the case. Yeah. And, and state troopers, you know, I, I like to make fun of state troopers a whole lot. It's, it's kind of my thing. I like to make fun of Marines too. That's just the army in me. But the reality is that state troopers don't normally have backup. They have it, but they have to, they have to have a mindset that they don't have it because Oftentimes they're on these very rural long stretches of road where backup, you know, 10 minutes is basically you don't have backup, right? Because good luck extending a fight or extending an arrest for 10 minutes. It's just not going to happen. You know, even if it goes extremely sideways and south, you're still talking a minute, 45 seconds, two minutes at most um, before uh, before somebody's either on the ground or in cuffs or, or whatever. So you pretty much have to know that backup's not coming until the fight's over. And, um, but you know, regardless, Hare gets out of his car to help what he thinks is a stranded motorist. Is that correct? Yeah, pretty much. So, so what happened is this happened at on March fifteenth at about five forty in the morning. And the reason that he was there in the in in the the first place is because there were a couple different callers who were traveling along I forty who saw Jeremy Smith outside of his car and it looked like the car was disabled, had a flat tire, and he was basically trying to flag down drivers. So that's what he was trying to do. So luckily and thankfully, no civilian drivers you know stopped to help him. But that that generated a call for police. So that was the call for service that um, uh, Officer Hare was was responding to. Basically, you know, just uh, someone along the side of the highway who looked like they needed some help with their car. Um, and it's at that point that Officer Hare pulled up uh, right right behind the white BMW. Um, Jeremy Smith was in the front seat of that vehicle, and Officer Hare he didn't even get out of his car. He stayed in the driver's seat of the car, and Jeremy Smith walked over to the to the officer's car, and he walked to the the front passenger side. And Officer Hare is pretty much talking to him through the window. And, you know, we don't have the body cam of this, but you know, what happened during that encounter has been relayed to us um, by, uh, by the, the state police chief. And, you know, basically what, what that encounter was like was that uh, Officer Smith was asking, uh, I mean, so Officer Hare was asking Mr. Smith if he needed a ride into town. So essentially the last conversation that he ever had was he was offering help. He was offering to give Mr. Smith a ride into town. And that's when things went terrible. No good deed goes unpunished. Um, uh, there was, a, for myself, I worked on a side of town and there was a known gang member that I was familiar with. He was on the wrong side of town. Um, not not because of race or, or anything like that, because of the color of the flag that he wears in his pocket. He was on the red side of town with a blue flag. And I knew that. And I said, hey, man, get in my car. You can't be over here. I don't want to clean you up off the streets later. And he was like, nah, Tanny, I'm good. I'm good. Dog. I'm good, Tanny. I'm good. And I was like, no, man, I'm not. I'll drop you off before we get to your, your hood. But like, I, you don't need to be walking from here back. Like just jump in. And he's like, well, can we stop by the basketball courts? And I say, sure. And he jumps out of my car and he runs and he die, goes down the hill on the backside of this thing. And he looks to see if I'm still there or if I'm chasing. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he comes back and he gets to my car. I'm like, what was that about? He's like, oh, I just, I had to see if somebody was there and they weren't there. And I was like, what? And he was like, can we stop by this apartment really quick? I have to grab my cell phone. And I was like, okay. So we go by this self, there's this apartment. He runs up, he opens the door and he throws something into the apartment. And then he comes back and he gets out. I'm like, what, you, what was that? And he was like, oh, I had to get my cell phone. He clearly did not get his cell phone. 
as I'm driving him to his side of the area, which is maybe a minute down the road, my computer is like burp, burp, alert that a body had just been found behind the B-dubs market. What this man had done was thrown the gun down in the back of the woods, out the off backside of the basketball courts, and the phone that he used during the murder, he threw inside this house. So this man got into my front seat of my car with a gun that he just murdered somebody with, shot him dead in the center of the head, and on a cell phone. Um, no good deed goes unpunished, right? You, you know, and, and, and that's kind of like the hardest part about being a cop is we can't just police that everybody is, is safe. But that's how the citizens want us to behave, is it not? Like that we want to treat them as if they're all innocent until we deem that they're guilty. When I say no, you're a piece of shit until you prove to me that you're not a piece of shit. That's exactly. how you have to act. It sucks. But I mean, what do you? what is your thought on that? You just retired. I, I mean, you, you, maybe you get lucky your whole career. And you have this open hand of kindness with everybody and it never gets folded in. I would rather start with an iron fist and you as the citizen have to unfold my fist into an open hand of kindness. Yeah, because could you imagine what would have happened if Officer Hare would have approached this, you know, and as soon as he got on scene, he started screaming and yelling and barking orders and commands to to Justin, uh, to uh, Mr. Smith, who's in the car. Can you imagine, you know, and then if there was a use of force or something like that, you know, but it's like looking back in 2020 hindsight, you know, obviously like that would have been the, the, the correct thing to do because it, the officer didn't know who this guy was. And, you know, I mean, the, the majority of the time, just, just like you said, we treat people, you know, unless they give police officers a reason to feel in fear for their safety, you know, the majority of the time, that's not how police officers handle calls like that. Um, it, like you, you talked about being lucky. Um, you know, in my career, I was on patrol in uniform and in the DWI unit going after drunk drivers for about 15 years. I made about 3000 arrests for drunk, drunk driving. You know, I was never involved in an officer involved shooting and that's luck because there were guys in my squad who did less traffic stops than me less arrests than me who were involved in officer involved shootings and so again it's 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 just luck you pull over that that wrong person and just there's no reason that me working in 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 Albuquerque, which is one of the most violent cities in the country, should go all that time without being involved in an officer-involved shooting. And here you have Trooper Hare, who's really in, you know, kind of like a lower crime farmland area where there really isn't a whole lot going on. And he wasn't responding to like a shots fired call or a domestic dispute or any kind of a felony in progress. It was a guy who needed help because his car was disabled. I don't remember the Marine that said it. Um, and all you other Marines can go eat 10 dicks uh, in the, the messages later because I don't know the Marine's name, but some Marines said, uh, well, and I'm going to butcher it so you guys, again, can just murder me in the DMs. Go for it. Um, but he says, like, you should always carry a fork because you never know, like, you never know when you're going to have a slice of pie or you're going to need to stab a motherfucker. Um, or the other quote from the other Marine was, uh, be kind and courteous to everyone, but have a plan to kill them. Actually, I think it might've been the same guy that said both of those. He always carries a fork in his pocket because you never know when he's going to want to take a bite of some pie or he's going to need to stab somebody. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, it is like be kind and courteous, but have a plan on how you're going to kill everyone. You know, that's a great day. You know, as a, as a police officer, society wants you to, to lower your guard. I preach about or preach against the protector mindset constantly. Society wants you to have a protector mindset. I'm here to protect you first. I'm here to protect you on the side of the road first. Wrong. That's wrong. It's fundamentally wrong if you're a cop. You have to be a warrior first. This guy's got to, you got to pull over on the side of the road. You got to get out. You got to have your hands ready to go. The center of your chest. You can see your fingers and look like you're not ready for a fight, right? We could trick them, but you have to have that warrior mindset. Hey man, what's going on tonight? How can I help you? Hey, stand right over there really quick. You got any weapons on you really quick? You're a warrior first. You're not like, hey, can I can I change your tire? Society has, has, has created this mindset in us over the last 10 years, and it's extremely dangerous because a protector is reactive, not proactive. It sucks, man, because it, it, it's, it's shit like this. This is a good human being. Justin was trying to be a good human being. He didn't get out of his car. He sat in his car. Come on over, bud. What can I help you with? Right? Because that's what society has created in us. He, you know, I got, I've been, I haven't been pulled over by a trooper in a very long time, but 
you know, this is this is you know pulled over by a trooper for any reason. You know, you got that campaign hat. What are you doing? What are you doing? You know what I mean? But you respected them. You were like, oh shit. Uh, I'm going to reach slowly to my glove box. You know, but now we've created these this this very like pacifistic protector police officer out there, and police officers are dying because of it. What is your take on that? I, it's it's a fine line, right? That's why they call it the thin blue line. It is, and and, and in this case, for for whatever reason, Officer Hare he didn't treat this like a regular traffic stop because, again, on a regular traffic stop, th there is no situation where the police officer stays in the car and allows the driver to come back to towards that officer. So, for whatever reason, you know, Officer Hare didn't treat it, and, and maybe there was a good reason for it. And you know, that's why I'm hoping that we will have the body camera footage at some point come out. But for whatever reason, he didn't treat this like a normal traffic stop. And you know, so again, he's sitting in the driver's seat of the car. Um, uh, Smith is uh, talking to him through the passenger side. He's offering him a ride into town, trying to help him. And it's at that point, really just without any kind of a warning, um, Smith pulls out a gun and he shoots Officer Hare through the passenger side window. Um, it's, it, it's at that point that Smith then walks over to the driver's side. He shoots Officer Hare again. Um, after he shoots him a, a, a second time, he then pushes Officer Hare from the driver's seat to the front passenger seat. He hops into the, the front seat of the patrol car and he takes off. Yeah, and as somebody says it's sad that this is the way that people have to think now. No, 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 Loren, that, it's, it's not now. Cops, cops 10 years ago, uh, more than 10 years ago, 2010, 2011, 2009 even, right? We we had this warrior mindset. A lot of departments had warrior mindset training, Um Brought to you by Lieutenant Colonel Grossman. Brought to you in the academies. I did. I did five days of warrior mindset training. Um, three days of cops just getting murdered and being scared to death. And then two days of victorious cops who did not get killed and didn't have serious use of forces because they were warriors first. And that's why you have to have this presence. Your your uniform's got to be clean. you got to be in shape. You got to be stern and direct. If this cop had gotten out, I'm not. Listen, I'm not. I'm not saying this guy did anything wrong because it's not his. It's not Hare's fault. It's society's fault. It's the way that we have brainwashed our police to be because we want cops to be dead. Like our society wants dead cops and alive criminals. Pr prove me otherwise. But you would have taken Hare ten years ago, nine years ago. He would have gotten out of the car immediately. No cop ten years ago would have had a discussion with anybody sitting in their patrol vehicles. That is something that is new. You would have been out flashlight in their face. You don't have to be an asshole, but Hey man, how's it going tonight? Hey, real quick before I help you out, you got any weapons on you? No. What's wrong with your car? Hey, just stand back really quick right there. I'm going to pat you down real quick, man. Just for you say it's the middle of nowhere. I don't know what you got. Any problems with that? I don't want you pat me down. Fair enough, bud. Uh, I'll call you a tow truck. I'll see you on the next one. Boom, and you bounce, right? I mean, that's how those would have gone. But now society's like, well, that's mean. You're here to protect and you're here to serve. No, 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 I'm here to live. I'm here to live so that my nine-year-old daughter, my nine-year-old son, my nine-month-old baby, like this Jonathan uh, Diller left behind in New York, I, I want them to have a good life. And I don't know who the fuck you are. I don't care about you, really. It's yeah, that absolutely. warrior mindset. Oh, go ahead. I'm so sorry. But so, no, so anyway, I, I, go back to Loren really fast. Loren, it's that that's that's not now. Now is we have to we have to play patty cakes with everybody. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, you're absolutely right because there still is a place for the warrior culture in policing because no one calls a social worker to kill a monster. Yeah, I mean, I just I mean, like, and I, you know, you're on the DUI squad, right? Um, and it's probably easy. You did three thousand. Um, Travis, it's probably pretty easy to get complacent, but I bet you in that 3,000, every 100, somebody popped off on you. Somebody slapped you in the face. Somebody kneed you in the groin. Somebody took off in their car and wrecked it into a telephone pole. I bet you have stories for days. And it, it kind of like gets you back in the rhythm, right? You're like, oh, man. And be honest with me, Daniel. I'm sure out of that 3,000, something happened where you were like, 
yeah, I probably shouldn't have leaned into the car that much. I probably should have been a little bit more assertive. She was really tiny, and I didn't think she was going to come at me like a pissed-off kitty cat. You know, was there a time like that? You don't have to be, I don't, I'm not here to like embarrass you or, or shame yourself, but were there, was there a time and be honest. And if not, be honest, I don't care. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Tell the people I'm wrong. But was there ever a time where you were like, yeah, I probably should have been a little bit more proactive versus reactive on that traffic stop? Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. There were, so uh, Albuquerque is known for a couple things, uh, Breaking Bad and MMA. And there was one time when I, I arrested, uh, I arrested someone and he was a nice guy. You know, he's, he was in his twenties. He was a smaller guy. He was like five, four. Um, I arrested him for, for drunk driving. He was nice. He was friendly. He was, he was cooperative. Um, as we're going, as we're driving to, to jail, he said something to me like, you know, like you're lucky that, that you're a nice guy or else this could have gone bad for you. And I kind of just laughed it off, you know, because people say those kinds of things all the time and yeah. then you know later on i have a friend who uh, uh t teaches uh uh, uh b j j j here and, and and i told him the guy's name and he said oh yeah he would have fucking killed you he would have killed you man so and so that, that kind of stuff happens all the time and i would i had no idea you know you know i was you know i mean I, I was you know i had this guy by 50 pounds he was like five four and uh, he would have killed murdered me you. if he wanted to murdered you murdered you yeah you you got to be kind and polite and that's why i say that's like I, I think all cops should be doing brazilian jiu-jitsu of some sort our swat team came to our brazilian jiu-jitsu gym um this week and 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 trained at our bjj gym um and there's several of the scu guys or swat guys that actually train every week at the gym but every once in a while they bring the whole squad in even the guys that don't train and um at our gym there's this 20 year old kid so sweet so kind such a nice guy i'm not gonna embarrass him by giving you his name um big cauliflower ears very skinny though almost has like an asian-esque appearance to him but very unassuming except for the cauliflower ears and if you're not looking for that he would at the end of this training these SWAT guys who are, are their full-time SWAT full-time and they train at Fort Bragg with Delta with Green Berets they they're one of the uh they're on the FBI's HRT like uh, QRF response team um super highly trained individuals and they were like dude this 20 year old kid could fuck all of us up maybe at the same time at least three of us like this kid will kill you. He'll kill me. And I've been training BJJ for a couple months. I even you, like maybe your baton works, but if it doesn't, oh man, if this dude gets inside of you, he's 20. He weighs oh, I don't know. I fought him the other day. I'd say he probably was 145, 150 at the most. I fought him the other day with gloves on. He had gloves on, I did not. That means he doesn't have dexterity because he's got these gloves on, these MMA gloves. I don't, I never saw the light of day in five minutes. I never saw the light of day. He maintained a top position on me for five straight minutes or had his, or had my back for the whole five minutes. You really don't know who you're dealing with. Um, I can remember pulling a guy out of the car who was crying and who was a flamboyant homosexual. And the minute he stepped out of the car, he blasted me in the face, knocking out some of my teeth. I broke my arm. I've talked about it on the show before. And it's because he was a flamboyant homosexual. I treated him a little different. I was like, there's no way this flaming homosexual is going to beat my ass. He's going to be sweet and kind and I don't want him to be scared. I want him to know that he can trust me. And so I was nice and kind and courteous and I let him step out of his car without putting my hands on him to, to try to make him trust me. And what did I get for it? Some shattered teeth. No good deed goes undone. I encourage you to, to if you're a first responder, to remember that guys, at you were a warrior at first and that guy needs to prove to you that he's going to comply with you. I don't care if you're changing their tire on the side of the road. I'm not saying go be a dick. And that's what I'm saying. This 20-year-old kid I'm telling you about, how unassuming he is, I promise you, I would bet a month of my salary that this kid will not go into a bar and start shit with anyone. I bet you this kid will never lay his hands on his girl. I bet you he says yes, ma'am, to his mother and his father but he can kill probably 95% of human beings in the city of Raleigh, North Carolina with his bare fucking hands. That's what a warrior is, right? Kind, courteous, respectful, but will fucking murder you. And you have to be that cop. You gotta be that guy. This is such a sad story. Where does the story take us from here? I cannot imagine this manhunt, first of all. I can't imagine being a cop going like, fuck, we got to find a blood trail for our brother. 
Yeah. So what 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 happened next is that you know so Officer Hare is in the passenger seat. Smith is driving in the in the the, the police car in the driver's seat. At some point, they pull off of I I forty highway and they get they get onto the to the frontage road. And while he's in the while they're on, while they're on the frontage road, Smith pushes Officer Hare out of the car and basically leaves him on the side of the road to die. It's at that point that the alert tone goes off. And, and at this point, I'm not sure if it's the alert tone that's on the, on, on his, his police car because of a crash or, or if it's, um, uh, it, it's some kind of alert tone that's on his radio, but either way, the the alert tone, you know, essentially that the officer needs help. Alert tone goes off, and it, it's at that point that um, other officers are sent to go and check on him. There was another officer um, from New Mexico State Police, and then a deputy from the Quay County Sheriff's Office. Those are those are the 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 two officers that that first responds to the scene. And the video that you showed a little bit ago, th that is those officers um, who are the ones who first respond, who find Officer Hare. Now, when they find Officer Hare on the side of the road. He's still alive. Could you imagine? I mean, I, what I cannot imagine laying there and just in fear. Is somebody coming for me? Are they not? Am I going to just be ravaged by coyotes? Like the thoughts in my brain would be so dark. Um, uh, what a just a tragic story. Does it have a good ending? Yeah, so it it's it it has is is almost as good of an ending as you could possibly have. Now, now, uh, you know, uh, obviously they weren't able. So a, a manhunt started for Smith. You know, very quickly on, um, New Mexico State Police um, were able to release a photo of this guy back on their end. They were doing all kinds of investigation. They knew who, who he was pretty quick. So this happened on March March fifteenth. This goes twenty four hours all the way to March sixteenth. There's there's a manhunt. You know, basically we have the feds, we have officers from the Albuquerque area, state police. Like this is one of the biggest manhunts um, that, that I've seen here in New Mexico in, in the 20 years that I've, I've been uh, I've been a police officer here and there, there, there is one other thing thing that that, that happened kind of kind of before that the ending is so the next day on March 16th there's a town called Santa Rosa which is about an hour from where this happened so on the way to Albuquerque but there was a shots fired call um, so basically this is this is really in the middle of nowhere and there was a rancher who was kind of just checking on his checking on his livestock and he sees a guy who matches the the description of Mr. Smith that he and and is basically firing shots at this rancher now now again this is in the middle of nowhere and you know there aren't a whole lot of people there certainly there aren't a whole lot of people you you know, shooting at people, you know, randomly. Um, right. So the, the the media, so they basically um, put the search there. They're not able to find him. This was in the evening on March 16th. March 17th comes and just about nine o'clock in the morning, um, kind of not in a great area of uh, of, of, of Albuquerque. It, it's a, a, a gas station in the South Valley. If you watch Breaking Bad, they talk about the South Valley a lot. That's where this happened at. So what happened was is, you know, here we are almost 24, almost 48 hours later and Smith, he goes into a gas station and he tries to buy cigarettes. Now, the clerk behind the counter is, uh, even though this is this is a terrible area, this is this clerk is a, a, a not only is she a great person and a reasonable person, but she's someone who pays attention. She knew what Mr. Smith looked like, and she was looking for him. So as Mr. Smith comes in, you know, she has to basically. She she basically she she should win an Academy Award for this because she thinks it's him. She thinks it's him, but she doesn't want to let on that she knows. So what she does, even though this guy's obviously over you know 18 or 21 years old, as he's trying to buy cigarettes, she IDs him. She gets his driver's license, and you know, she wanted to make 100 percent sure that it was him. He gives her the ID. He gives her the ID. She, she sells him cigarettes. As soon as he's out of the door, she immediately calls police and, and uh, deputies with the Bernalillo County Sheriff. Um, Bernalillo County is, is the sheriff's department, you know, basically right in Albuquerque. So the deputies with the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office were there quick. Um, they, get, they end up in a foot chase with this guy, and um, he resists arrest, and he's shot by police officers. Um, he doesn't get killed. He, he survives, um, but uh, Smith is injured. Um, he was transported to the hospital. No police officers were injured um, getting him into custody. Oh, man. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I mean, I wish he would have died. I, I mean, I'll say that. I wish death upon him. I really do. Well, I never want to wish death upon anyone. Yeah, I do. I yeah, it, it was it was St. Patrick's Day, so I was hoping he was shot by an Irish cop. Oh, that would have been epic. Um, I'm guessing hair was not, by the looks of it, hair was not Irish. <laughs> Definitely looks like he was of uh, maybe Hispanic descent. Is his hair maybe like of some kind of Hispanic descent? You know what? Uh, I'm not sure. 
I'm not sure either. But uh, um, did they use Trooper Hair's cuffs? Now, this is Abby Ellsworth. She's got a podcast called On Being a Police Officer. It's brilliant. Um, I encourage you guys to go out there and take a look at a lot of stories. Have you been on, on her show? Absolutely. I think I was on the episode right after you. Nice. Yeah. So phenomenal person. She has a question though. Um, did they use his hair's cuffs on him? Now, Jonathan Diller, they did use Diller's cuffs on that, on that suspect. Um, I don't know so, when this one, you know, by chance. So I, I don't know for sure, but my guess is probably not because this incident, oh, you know, the, 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 the murder of officer hair happened about three hours away. And at this point there was some information that Smith had a connection to Albuquerque and he was traveling West on I 40 towards Albuquerque. But again, there was, there was no, I, I think they kind of had a feeling he was headed towards Albuquerque, but again, it, the, he could have been in Santa Rosa. So, you know, really they didn't know where he was. Um, so, you know, at the time that he was, he was shot by, uh, uh, police officers, um, they, they didn't have access to, to officer Harris handcuffs because yeah. they're about three, out, three hours away. I bet you they'll use them though in court. Yeah. So typically that's the way it works. Now, if you're in a fucking woke city, like I am, uh, we don't allow that. We, we don't allow that kind of behavior here. So they're not going to allow, uh, somebody else's cuffs. At least that's what I've been told in some of the cases, uh, in some of these bigger cities, uh, these lefty left leaning soft on crime cities. Uh, we don't, we, you know, we don't want to be disrespectful to the guy who murdered a cop. Oh, get me started. It's been a rough week for me. I, you know, when I first started this show and you guys in the chats that have been here from, from day one, you know, folk, I see you in here at Bosco Autry. I mean, you guys know that when Mike used to get political, I would go, Oh, here we go. You know, I was the guy that hated the politics and I never do it. But like, now that I'm in it, now that I, now that it's 2024, it's like, how do you not? Is there somebody out there that's not political anymore? <laughs> Are, can you be not political anymore? It just seems so absurd right now with the just epic rise in violent crimes and property crimes going across the country. And the fact that the government is hiding it right now, the fact that uh, the, the a rise in violent crime that's being reported by the, by victims um, on, on private uh, websites is not matching up with the department of justice is putting out. Why it's never in the history. Has it ever, has it ever been off? Why is it now that the Department of Justice's website is so far off from the victims of whatever website? Uh, I'm actually going to do a whole episode on that because uh, I just learned of it late last night and was talking and was like, dude, this is insanity. Um, and then I woke up this morning and tried to find uh, officers killed in the line of duty 2024, right, like statistics of violence on police statistics for 2024. Couldn't find anything in the first three pages. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's apparent, it's clear, it's politically motivated, which is extremely scary um, that, you know, that we're this politically uh, intertwined as, as law enforcement officers, as first responders, very scary times that we live in. And, um, you know, all I can say is you better be a warrior. You better be a warrior first. You want to, you want to play and flirt with this whole protector thing. Go for, best of luck. It's not working. It isn't working. Cops are being murdered by it because of it. you got to, you got to have that warrior mindset. You've got to get in the zone, be kind and be courteous and have a plan to kill everyone. Um, Daniels, how do you want to, how, how, Mr. Daniel, how, Officer Daniel, retired Daniel, how do you want to bring us out, man? You got anything that you want to end? I don't want to take the last lick. The, the last thing that, that, that I want to say is, you know, so uh, Smith is facing, he's obviously has a long criminal history. He's facing, um, he's going to be facing, you know, murder charges here in New Mexico, also murder charges in South Carolina. Um, likely South Carolina has the death penalty. Um, so uh, we're kind of hoping that, uh, I think he's going to stay in New Mexico first, but, um, you know, we're all kind of hoping that that's where he ends up. Um, and the last thing that, 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 that I want to say about this is, um, it's something that you mentioned um, at, at the beginning of the show, is that, you know, uh, when, when a police officer dies in the line of duty, you know, why is a police officer's life valued more than other people's lives? And, you know, that's a question that I get a lot. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's something that I've, I've thought about a lot. And, you know, a police officer's life doesn't have any more value. You know, everybody has equal rights. You know, everybody brings some value. Everybody has people that they love. But, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it hits different when it's someone who's out there and their job is to protect the rest of us. It just hits a little bit different when they're die when they are merging the line of duty because the good guys aren't supposed to die like that.
Yeah, my dad told me, my dad was very anti-police growing up, um, grew up in the, the swamps of Florida and, you know, was basically a Leonard Skinner guy, his whole life, big, long hair and the dungy boots and the, the, the whole things and uh, running, running weed and, you know, doing all sorts of stuff. But he told me that uh, he said, and he got his ass whooped. He said, I got my ass whooped by the police one time on a bad drug, on, on a bad drug deal. They kicked in. I was with a bunch of bikers and, um, and they caught me and, and I was, you know, he's like, I, I wasn't really, I was just there and they drove me around and they were talking in the front seat, how they were going to, where they were going to drop me and where they were going to beat my ass. And I was freaking out. And then literally they pulled me out and he was like, we were, um, on the backside of a beach, uh, near an intercoastal. And he was like, I was, he was like, I was about to like piss my pants. I thought this is where the cops kill me. And they uncuffed me and they got in their cars and they just left. And he said, but even then he's like, never, ever would I once think. And he's like, and, and nor did I ever hang out with anybody like that again. And he's like, but I never thought of committing violence on a police officer. He's like, I was, I would run from the cops. I would talk shit to the cops, but never in my million, like never would I ever think to fuck with a cop because the cop is going to win in the end. And he's like, it blows my mind how many co how many times, Eric, that you get your ass beat at work or have somebody punch you or kick you or bite you or spit on you. He's like, dude, in my day, that wouldn't happen. <laughs> like they would, Because if you did, they would drive you to that same spot on the intercoastal and you would never be seen again. And, uh, you know, it, it's crazy. Diesel, Je Diesel Tech Bosco says, my dad sounds like his kind of people. He was. He was a big fan of uh, Dire Straits and... Uh, uh, Eric Clapton. I was actually named after Eric Clapton and Eddie Van Halen. So that's why my name is Eric Edward. Uh, that's that's what my dad. That's the story he tells. So I'm, I'm I'm white trash at heart, right? White trash at heart. You guys don't know anything about white trash over in New Mexico, though. You don't have white trash, do you? Oh no, we do. We, we oh, you do? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I'm from I'm from like the swamps of Florida. Like it's all like pure redneck. Like it's it was it was a really weird place to grow up for sure. I live in North Carolina now, which is a lot more. Uh, less rednecky but uh, <laughs> i do have redneck roots but i but i escaped my roots right you know they say you can't uh, you can always take the hood out of the you can take the hood rat out of the hood but you can never take the hood rat out of the no you never take the hood out of the hood rat i don't know anyway listen only once yeah yeah I, I was a redneck and i'm no longer a redneck so <laughs> maybe, maybe that quote's bad <laughs> hey listen where can they follow you um how can we learn more from you yeah, thanks. So, thank you so much for having me on. Um, you could follow me everywhere: um, Instagram, uh, YouTube, uh, TikTok, Twitter. Um, over at Police Law News, I also write articles um, over on Substack. Over at Police Law Newsletter. All right, very nice. Uh, thank you so much. We'd love to have you back thank anytime. You. If you ever got another case, you guys go and follow Police Law News. We'll be back again uh, on Patreon this weekend. Um, We'll have an episode out for you guys on the Patreons this weekend with Nick Paul Michano coming up pretty soon. So we'll see you guys. Uh, Jay Keefe in the chats, ABA Ellsworth, Falconator, Diesel Jack, Teresa K. Uh, Diesel Jack's, uh, Diesel Tech says Freebird. Uh, that guy, Ryan89, Guns and Cafe. I'm not going to go up forever, but love you guys. Teresa Flobert, thank you all for being in the live chats with us today. Uh, we'll see you guys soon. Cheers. <laughs>